thank God that we brought back to old time, couldn't we? No. Oh, there's my glasses. <laughs> you know, that brings up a funny story this morning. Uh, so I got up this morning, I went down to the computer, and I was studying a little bit. And I walked into the kitchen, got the bacon and eggs out, the milk, stuff, and get ready for breakfast. Went back into the computer, sat down, and he told me that's not why I went in there. I went in there to clean my glasses. I didn't know that until I looked at the computer, saw the dirt. You know, so it uh, kind of reminds me of a story I heard that uh, you have three sisters that live together, they're older, older, yeah, older ladies, we'll say, 92, 94, 96. Yeah. And the 96 year old lady, she went up to the third floor or second floor and draw a bath of water, and she put her foot in the water and she yelled out, was I getting in the tub or getting out of the tub? And uh, her second sister, the 94 year old one, says, well, hold on, I'll come up and see. And she was walking up and stepping on her sink, and she says, wait a minute, was I going up the stairs or down the stairs? And a 90 year old sister heard her, she was in there having a cup of tea in the kitchen, and she said, man, I hope I'm never going to be as forgetful as they are, not on wood. She said, give me a minute, I'll be right up to help you out as soon as I'll answer the door. So it's amazing how uh, you, know, you get a little older, you start thinking a little different. And uh, yeah, it's like when I read these days, it's like, is it my eyes or is it my brain? I can't figure out which. So, so, uh, so anyway, uh, I, I'm uh, privileged to be here today. Uh, Pastor uh, Dave asked me to come by and fill in for him. And, um, you know, it's funny because I resisted all my young life, since I was about 20, uh, minister. My dad always wanted me to be a pre preacher, you know. And I said, Dad, ain't no money in preaching. <laughs> so he used to say, uh, you know, you, you, you're supposed to be a preacher. And my mother said, you're going to be a preacher no matter what, because every time I get asked to speak somewhere, it's usually to go and speak like a preacher does, you know what I mean? But, uh, but I'm a preacher's kid, learned a lot of stuff over the years, and learned a lot of a lot of stuff from top moment. And uh, my dad, some of the old uh, Brother Heberly, Brother Hill, you know, Brother Hill used to say, uh, uh, he used to say, I don't need to go to know with Bobby Hill to talk about education, you know, back in the day. You've got your scripture, and that's what you going. He said, I don't need to go to no cemetery. I get my, my Bible on knowledge of theology. I'm going to just kneel down, and God's going to give it to me. But uh, hopefully you won't depend just on theology today. You know, save time. Uh, did a little bit of study anyway. But, uh, but I do appreciate being here. And every time I come down, uh, it brings so many memories back. I, I walked in the church this morning, and I saw how beautiful it was. It really nice. it really does. The paint colors and all, and the carpet was so good. I remember when I was I was building these altars, and me and Ray, we practically remodeled the church about two years it took us. And I remember Pastor Jason was the pastor coming in. We were building the altars that day. I said, man, how tall are you? He said, six foot nine. I said, must be an over, because every age is six foot nine. <laughs> so, so it must be a reason, you know. But, uh, but anyway, today, I want to ask you a question. Now, I think all of us can answer. Um, with, have you ever really been challenged with an enemy combating you, challenged with something that just seemed like it was an insurmountable odds that you could not get over, and you could not find your faith and your strength to really accomplish getting over that goal. I think every one of us has had that kind of thing happen to us. You know, there's, there's scripture in the Bible, and I love the Old Testament stories in the Bible. I love war stories anyway, you know. And uh, when I go into the Old Testament and read some of this stuff, it's amazing the lessons that you can get out of reading some of the old uh, battles in the uh, Old Testament. And it's just interesting how you can pull that stuff out. But if you have your Bibles with you, now some of you are going to have your tablets, your phones, your uh, computers, whatever you have. I actually have, uh, let me show you this. This is a, uh, a Bible I got from my mother for Christmas. And look at the size of that from actually got the yeah. I still need my glasses. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to uh, do a flow here and get through this to... Maybe we can learn a few things to help us uh, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. And what I'd like to entitle this message is, God's Got This. How many can say, say that with me, God's Got God's This. God's, God's, God's Got This. this. You know, I want to talk about the story of Gideon. And the first thing I want to say is, under a woman named Deborah, the Israel had 40 years of rest and peace. It says here, so the land had rest for 40 years. Then what happens is, then the children of Israel, I'm sorry, this is on the sixth chapter of Judges. I'll wait for a second. Six chapter of Judges. We're going to read the story of Gideon. And we're going to relate to that, to how we look at our things in life today. So if you're there, 
We're going to start the first uh, verse. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them in the hands of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens and caves and strongholds which are in the mountains. You know, it always seemed to start that way. We as human beings were constantly, you know, I think probably that if, I, I probably epitomized the spirit of David. Because I'm always messing up, you know. He said, God said he was a man after my own heart. But he was always messed up. You know some of the stories that he, what, he, what he did. But it, it always starts out with that way. But what happened was, the Midianites started, and for seven years, every year, when Israel would grow their crop, they'd have fresh water, all the things that they built up for themselves, the Midianites would come in, and they, the Bible says that it's, they were like locusts. It says, um, oh yeah, let me just go ahead and read it. Then they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel. Left them with nothing, bone dry. For they, they would come... Yeah, but they would come up with their livestock, and they would, their tents coming as numerous as lo locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished by uh, the uh, Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So they finally come to their senses and said, you know, uh, what are we going to do about this? It says, um, and then it says, now the angel of the Lord, this is on verse 11, when we jump down there, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the uh, Tabernet tree, which was in Ophrah, Ophrah, not Ophrah, and uh, which belonged to Joash and Abzerite, Abzerite, while his son Gideon, uh, uh, Joash's son Gideon, thrashing wheat in the wine press in or, order to hide it from the Midianites. They literally were hiding their wheat and thrashing it underneath the buildings because they were hiding from this forces army that was coming against them. And uh, so, um, we turn to the next page here. We're going to go to uh, Gideon uh, 13, uh, chapter 13. So, the bottom line is, Israel had really done badly in the sight of God. They were sinning again, and God wasn't there. So, then he came to Gideon. God came to Gideon and says, Gideon said, to, uh, he says, appeared to him and said to him, Thy Lord, uh, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now, I thought about that, but that would be like, now here you are, you're a man hiding from the Israelites. You're smashing up wheat underneath the tent so nobody can see what you're doing because you're scared. You're really worried about these guys coming in and taking what you've got and all your work and, and of course, hurting you uh, physically. And how God said, you man of valor. That kind of feels sheep doesn't it? <laughs> you know? well, what do you mean, Lord? So Gideon, he gets upset. And he starts blaming the Lord for his plight. He says, Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has this, has this happened to us? And where are his, all your miracles, or his miracles, which our father told us about, saying... Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And if I go back and we look at the, um, the chapter, number 8 chapter, um, it says, The Lord sent the prophet to Ju uh, the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus saith the Lord of Israel. Now God's answer, he said, Look, I brought you from the hand of Egypt, I brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. I was there for you, Gideon. You're the one who turned back on me. He said, I am the Lord thy God, do not fear gods of, of the Amorites, in which you land, uh, and in which your land and you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So, you know, it's like when I say to my kids, you know, there's a motto in our house, the good things come to those who do it, do good, and bad things come to those who bad, do bad. There's a consequence for your actions. And it's the same with God. He's our Father. And there's, we got to reap, reap what we sow. So, anyway, so then we have, um, so basically, don't, don't be a right fighter. You know, the bottom line, Dr. Phil says all the time, don't be a right fighter. Just because you're right, you may just wind up losing the battle. So it's here. Now, one thing we have to do is, in our own lives is stop playing the blame game. Put it on somebody else. Take responsibility for what we do. Where are we coming short in our, in our walk with God? And uh, so what I want to ask you is, will you doubt God as Gideon here? I mean, God's coming to him in an angel and he's talking to him, and he's still getting doubted. So the Lord said in chapter six, or, uh, number 16, verse 16, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you. Oh, no, let me go back. He says, the then, on 14, he said, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of many of us. Have I not sent you? He, even though he's basically looking in the face of God, blaming him for all this, God's still giving him grace. As all of us, 
We do that so many times. Why God? I had a friend of mine recently in the last couple of weeks. Um, he's a Christian guy. Um, and I don't know if some of you heard, I was on the radio, um, in a talk radio program on Friday evening. The, the week before, because I had written a book called Tragedy and Kid. And he had me there talk about the book coming out. And then what happened was two days later, his son passed away. And it was an overdose of heroin. Mm -hmm. And he, he hit a Christian man. He said to me, Don, why did God let this happen to me? You know. And I refer to the book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? You know, sometimes it's random uh, what happens. But it's not God's fault that what happens. But, you know, he doesn't orchestrate our tragedies, but he's there to pick up the pieces when they occur. That's right. We've got to be able to trust in him right. and yep. believe in him. It says, then the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Meaning one man, but he's going to lead an army. Then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, this is, this is uh, Gideon, then show me a sign that if you who, who talk with me. He said, do not part from you, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering. He's talking to this angel. And he says, let me come. And the angel says, I'll wait till you get back here. I'll wait for you. So Gideon went and he prepared a young goat and unleavened bread and from, the, and from Ephra of a, uh, and of flour. The meat he put in the basket. And anyway, so it goes on and he basically proves to him that this is his uh, angel. He is God and God's telling us. So then Gideon, he says, okay. Now Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, oh, I'll ask God. Uh, for I have been, seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So now he believes that this is really the angel. The angel's telling him, look, we're going to be there for you if you go out and do this. So see, <coughs> many nights nice and the other uh, genocides, and I think there were some termites in there. <laughs> 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 uh, they went out there, and uh, they were doing wrong by God. They were serving Baal, which is a, a, a graven image or what have you. So the angel told him, so we want you to go up there and destroy that altar. And we want you to have another sacrifice, a seven-year-old bull, and sacrifice that. Oh, we laughed that long. Uh, <laughs> sacrifice that uh, for an altar. So when he did that, he did it at night because he was afraid that they might see him. And the next day they said, uh, Joe Asher's son did this. And then they brought the entire army down, and they're going to wind up really uh, putting it on uh, Israel. And then it says here, it says, um, place here. So Jared bringing their son, he basically says they gathered around them, they camped about them, and they were about basically going to go ahead and attack Israel and take out the entire uh, army. And uh, it, uh, Gideon, he says, so, God, so Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, like he said back here, he says, then I, look, I, I need a fleece. In other words, he's going to put another test on the Lord. He's already done it once. Now he says, so, so in verse 36, so if Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I should put a fleece of wool on the thrashing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. Now, back then, they would take a goat's, uh, you know, um, the fur or whatever, the skin, and they would put it down the ground because they didn't have rain like we did, we did today. So if that, that fur was wet in the morning, then, and the ground was dry, then that would be a pretty good sign, wouldn't it? You know, that God is with us, this is his sign. Well, that was what happened. And then Gideon, again, doubting again. He still wasn't sure. This was a pretty big foe. These guys were out there in the field, and it just like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie 300. <laughs> it was just like, locusts everywhere. And uh, so he says, okay, God. And it, and it was so. When he rose early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece together, and it was wet. And he says, Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, can I do this just one more time to make sure? Do not be angry with me. Let me test. I, pr I pray just one more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on the ground let it be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece, only there was dew on the ground. And then at that point, uh, he, he says, okay, this is good. We're going to do this. We're going to go out there, and we're going we're to have a battle. And then uh, sometimes, even, even in the face of what God has we've tested, we see we're still not sure because we still doubt. We still are wondering if God is there for you know. So um, anyway, so he because he had those OMG moments, you know. He says, uh, "Not me, Lord. I'm the least." He was even the least in his family. So he said, "How in the world is God choosing me?" You know. And uh, so he says, "You know, God has anointed us to fight. He has given us the anointing. He gave getting the anointing to stand up on this battle and fight." And, you know, many of us today, we are fighting against so many things. I mean, we fight against fear of failure, keeping our marriage from falling apart, health issues, employment issues, paying the bills, encouragement, rejection, dishonesty, purity, pornography, addictions, parenting issues, integrity, infidelity, teens are fighting to be accepted, peer pressure, rebellion, rebellion, and the list goes on. 
But God has let us know that he has given us an anointing to fight these things because we have God in our camp. He's there to help us and to bring that battle to fruition in our favor. So the Lord said to Gideon, and the people are with you. And now this is, this is where it gets good. He said, and the Lord said to Gideon, one of, this is the chapter 7, number 2, uh, verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the many nights into, the, into your hand, lest Israel claim glory. God wants the glory. He doesn't want to let somebody else think. He said, if you take him with this big army, they're going to say, well, you have a big army, you were able to fight him. He says, so against me, saying, my own hand was saved, was saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim the nearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart. So, so he basically put a rule. He said, well, you guys, everybody I have in my army, just go. If you're a chicken, you don't want to do it, we're not going to say anything to you. Just, just the ones that want to fight, you come back and we'll accept you. So when they came back, they said, and 22,000 people returned, and 10,000, they returned where they were, and only 10,000 remained. Now remember that, you're talking about like 185,000 Mennonites, and you're here, uh, or Mennonites, and you're, you're right here, and you've only got 10,000 to fight them. It says, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with, with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you. Um, so essentially what he does, he brings them down to the water and he says, here's the deal. When the guys come down to the water, 10,000, the ones that lap with their tongues like a dog, they're not your guys. Okay? The ones that scoop up the water with their hand, you're going to keep them. Now, you got to remember, when they got done, Gideon was down to 300 men. 300 it's a huge, giant army, you know? And it says, uh, and it happened on the Lord's night that the Lord said to him, Arise and Now, this is another thing. Even with this, and he's down to 300 men. Now, the Lord, he's taken it back because he can understand, he relates to us. We're human beings, he understands us. So he knows when he gets down to 300 people, Gideon's going to be like, oh, I don't think so, <laughs> you know? I mean, think about it. What would you do? 300 people gets a mountain of just, uh, the army. So God says to him, it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the camp, for I have delivered into your hand. But you are afraid, if you're still afraid to go down there, go down to the camp with Perug, per per uh, your servant, and you'll so hear what they say. And when he went down there, what they heard was, they listened to the, to the tent, and they heard these um, generals and these leaders of the army talking. It says, uh, now the Midians and, and, and the uh, Amalekites, uh, all the people of the east were laying in the valley as a number uh, as oak locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore it was multiple. And when Gideon came there, was a man telling him, of, he was listening, he was telling a dream. And back then, they really took a lot of stock in dreams. If you dream something that you were an interpreter, you catch the good it was going to happen. He says, I have a dream. To my, to my surprise, a loaf of barley uh, bread tumbled into the camp immediately. It came to the tent and struck it so that it fell over and turned to the tent and it collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing short of the sword of, sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hands God has delivered Gideon and the whole camp. So from that one dream, they knew they were in a lot of trouble. Because they knew that it wasn't about, you know, I, I talked, as a matter of fact, the very one I talked about preaching many, many years ago. You remember this, Danny. Uh, I, I actually spoke for about a year. I was just a kid, but I was probably 20, 21, 22 years old. And I spoke on the hymn, Possible Victory. And I used to get in, in the Bible about that because it really is about who is behind you, who is in you, is going to make that, that um, uh, battle, and you're going to win it because of that. So he returned, so, so he comes back to the camp. And he heard that dream. He heard what was going on. He came back. He says, He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Medan into our hands. And they said, then he uh, delivered. Now, I'll try to just explain it because there's a lot of reading here. But essentially what he did was, he said, here's what I'm going to do, guys. There's only 300 of us. There's 185,000 of them. So you have these picture, pictures of, you know, whatever they had in them. And uh, they, had the, uh, they had their torches. So he said, when I go out there and I, and I start yelling, the Lord has delivered it into our hands, you start banging on these pictures and start waving your torches. Well, what happened was, because it was God, they ended up in that middle of that battle, and these guys were so confused and so scared by what was happening. I mean, they didn't have street lights back then. <laughs> they didn't see a whole lot. So they started turning on each other, and they were stabbing their own people. And, they, and, they, and as they run out and, and left, they left bodies all over the place because God was, was able to conquer for Gideon as a result of his believing and trusting and uh, you know, no, no doubt and uh, 
And he, did, he believed in what God was going to do. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, sometimes in our lives here, we can hear all about David, but we got to know what's going on in our lives now. There are things that are challenging us right now. Some of you are dealing with uh, uh, challenges and problems in your life. And sometimes, I think sometimes you have to go back to your past experiences where you were successful. And I'm going to share a story with you. And some of you are going to look at me like i got three heads. But if you don't believe the story, then you can come up. I'll give you the phone number from many people. There's nearly 40 people in the church that was there that evening. And I was just a kid. I was 10 years old. I had never been to the dentist in my life. Never had. And I had, a, I had four cabinets. We had well water with no flooring. <laughs> okay. Lived up here on 207th Street. I used to go to, right, the church is on 209th Street. Okay, you guys remember when I was with Brother Pearson Church. And um, uh, so anyway, I went to church that night and I had a really bad toothache. And my jaw was swollen up like this. Well, they used to have those shouting services sort of like we had here this morning. Only they would just add swinging from the chandeliers and running without the fences. <laughs> And they were running around the altars, you know. Some of you remember how it was. You remember, like, you remember uh, Hammer Bar Street? They used to have some shouting. I think it was, they used to have the, the wheelchairs and the uh, crutches and the braces hanging on the walls from healing from God. There was a time when I was a kid, you had healing and you could see it. You'd see it happen, you know. So this happened when I was 10 years old, going to church and they were having a shouting service and my two churches had prayed for me. I go back to the bathroom. I still remember like yesterday. Today, OSHA would, would probably shut the church down. They had a, a sink that was hanging on the side of the wall, and they had a mirror that was a piece of glass, about 12 inches brown or, or square, and had a broken corner, real sharp broken corner. And you've got kids going to the bathroom, right? So I'm in there, and all of a sudden I look, and my jaw is completely gone, and the pain's gone. So I'm looking at my mouth, looking at it, and I see a guy sitting in my tooth, start picking at it. A couple minutes later, now I'm telling you the truth. This is an absolute truth that this actually happened. I started literally seeing something begin to coat the inside of that cavity. It didn't fill up, but it was like somebody was painting gold leaf in, in my tooth. Gold. And then I looked at the other tooth that was rotten. I had four. I, they weren't a cavity. They were rotten. <laughs> you stick your fingers in those things. You could bury in that tooth. Um, so, so I saw that gold, and I was like, what in the world is going on here? And I'm just a kid. I don't know what's going on. And I look at the top two teeth, and I see a color that looks different, but it looks like silver. So I go and I'm trying to get my dad's attention. He keeps telling me, I'm trying to get his attention. Man, the place went nuts. And when I left there, my jaw was killing me. <laughs> because everybody wanted to see the book. Everybody wanted to see it. And that's the gospel. God's honest truth. We went home. Uh, There's probably 40 people in that church. And like I said, I can give you a phone number. You can pick up a phone call and they'll tell you, yes, I saw him. And uh, when I went home, we stopped at my granddad's house. And he was really not a believer. Hardcore guy. So they were having Ritz crackers and cream cheese. I'll never forget it. And I said, no, I won't have any. And my dad said, boy, that's your goal. You go ahead and eat what you want to eat. I wish I wanted to listen to him. Because <laughs> the next morning I got up and it was gone. So I proceeded to take this tooth out when I needed another pair of pliers by myself and succeeded well. And <laughs> took the tooth out. But I believe that many times what we see in our past, if you ever experienced a healing, who's here has experienced a healing from God's yeah. presence? Yeah. Most, most of us in the room. And I believe that you have to go back to that time when things were, you believed it because you saw it and you experienced it. And sometimes you have to be the prayer warrior for that person that has not experienced that to be their faith, to be their energy, to be able to make that happen. And it's like another, another quick story. Uh, and I, I testified about this story here and I actually brought video uh, and, and, and reports. I have a bag on my side. I have an ostomy. I've had it since 1992. And um, it's a convenience. I can go to the bathroom at the same time and never leave the table. <laughs> so, it's not bad. My reading levels drop a little bit, and I don't sit down and read, read, read on this old anymore. But, uh, <laughs> you know you were going to get that this morning, didn't you? But anyway, God blessed me with the gift of an offering. <laughs> so I really, I look at it as a gift, and that's what my book is called, Tragedy's Gift. And, uh, but I had an experience where I started having some difficulty and I started having some pain and some weird symptoms. Went to the doctor, long story short, went down and had to do a test. I think it was about eight hours long. They kept you know, putting things in me and x-raying me and doing all kinds of stuff. So they came back and we went back to the doctor the next day. He reviewed the report, the report and said, Don, you have what's called stoma hernias. And that's where the, the little, your intestine literally comes out the side of your body. And it got a, stoma, a hernia which was choking it. And uh, so he said, we're gonna have to do surgery, but it's a very invasive surgery because you have so much scar tissue <clears throat> And we may even have to reassign it to the other side. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm right-handed, dude. <laughs> you know? I don't want to do that, but I was going to do it. It would be nice to live. So he told me that there was a good chance that in the surgery I could die as a result of the surgery. It was very serious. 
So he said, before we do the surgery, I want to send you to another doctor. So he sent me down to have an MRI with contrast. You know, they put the dye in it. So they came back, had two reports. So I went on a Monday morning. We went there to see the doctor with that report. We didn't go there to discuss whether or not we were going to have the surgery. We were discussing the date to have the surgery. It was that serious. So he had two, two computers up on, on his desk. And one computer, it said, I had the stoma hernias. The full report. On the next one, there was a video or, or a, a film, and it had the report as well. It said, there, there are no stoma hernias. So he's going back and forth, he looks really confused, and it's like, I don't see any, uh, any problem with you. you know? Almost immediately I started feeling better. Within the next day I was fine, nothing, you know, and God healed me. And that's only been about, what, six years, seven years ago? Something like that? And so I just want to encourage you, when you are at a place where you're in a doubting situation, talk to somebody, give me a call. I'll pray for you. Give somebody a call that's been there, done that, has seen the Lord do things. You know? Now I will have to tell this one little funny thing, though. My father, he was a Pentecostal uh, preacher at the Pentecostal Church of Christ in Leesburg, Virginia. And uh, he believed he had what's called a leg-growing ministry. So a lot of times if you had a back problem, he put you on that front step, put your feet and your heels in his hand. And it, I kid you not, you see your leg going back and forth like that. So one day, he wanted to pray for me, and I keep avoiding him. He said, why don't you want to get prayed for? You don't believe. I said, well, I do believe that. I'm just having a hard time figuring out how 50% of the people in your church have one leg bigger than the other. <laughs> So, anyway, <laughs> I like to tease him a little bit. <laughs> so, so, anyway, I, I'm going to jump forward here a little bit. And I'm going to open up 1 Samuel 17. And I love the story of David. You know, this is really just one of the most amazing stories. Because, again, we're talking about faith. We're talking about God's got this. When Gideon won that battle with his men, God had it from the beginning. All he had to do was put his faith and trust in his belief in God and have faith to make sure that it happened and it was revealed to him. So it says here, and a champion out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits. I'm going to go through this real quick because I want to tell you, he's got like, you know, these ceilings right here are 10 feet tall, okay, 10 feet. Goliath was 9 feet 7 inches according to most experts um, guessing it. No, that's like only like, what, three feet, uh, three inches from the ceiling. That's a pretty big guy. I think he was pretty intimidating. But he, he was so strong that his spear, just the tip of the spear weighed 15 pounds. The average sword was only 2.4 pounds during the day. So you can imagine this big guy, and I think David was probably 5'7 at the best, you know. And he said his armor, just his, his armor on his breastplate was 126 pounds. That's probably what David weighed. <laughs> that 126 pounds, you know. So, so David, he comes up and he's like, you know, he says, then he talked with them. Uh, David was talking to the gentleman standing around because he listened to this Goliath out there. He says, then he talked with them. This is verse 23, 1723. And there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the name, uh, the same word. So David heard them and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man flee or uh, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who have come up? Surely he has uh, come to defy Israel. And it shall be that that man who has killed him, the king will enlist with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house an exemption from tax in Israel. I mean, if I get a tax exemption, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about a couple stones, frankly, you know. But think about it. I mean, all those riches and everything, and so the, jet, the people out there, because this guy was so fearful, you know, they fear him so much, that they weren't even going to take a chance of going out there. But David spoke to the men, and basically, they were like, well, who are you? You're just a little, little kid. And of course, Saul, uh, when David came, he says, I'll fight him. And, and Saul says to him, uh, hold on one second, let me grab my notes here. Uh, but yeah, Saul said to him, he says, what makes you think that you have what it takes to take this giant? You're not a warrior, you're a kid. You don't have any experience with this. And David says, yeah, but he said, when I was out in the field tending my father's sheep, a lion came out, and I was able to overpower him. And then a bear came, and this Philistine is going to fall just like that because it is in God's hand, not mine. So why did David have the confidence? Let me ask you a question. Are you confident in God in your life today? Are you confident that if you believe and you pray for something, it's going to happen? Now, don't get me wrong. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. You know, um, you have to build faith, and I'll touch on that just a little bit. It is tough at times. when you're depending, The bigger the obstacle is, the more difficult it can be. So... So anyway, the reason is, see, uh, Saul said, okay, uh, where did David get his confidence from? Goliath trusted his armor. David trusted in God. Goliath 
uh, covering, uh, is, uh, covering is fear and hate. David's covering is faith and love. Goliath's covering is carnal, fleshly, visible of the world. David's covering is spiritual and invisible. Since Goliath's universe is centered, focused on him, not focused on, oh, I'm sorry, focused on himself, David's universe is centered, focused on God. Goliath's heads of uh, protection is the dead armor. David's heads of protection is the living God. Goliath's brass armor manifests that he is proud of his sin. David's lack of armor manifests his humility. But if you look at the central theme of that whole thing, it really boils down to one thing, and that is putting everything in God's hands. See, Goliath was, wasn't just taunting Israel, but he was taunting the Israelites, and he was taunting God. And David, being on the side of God, he, he knew where he, he, he was going to be okay. You see, once you got to do it, and I love this, and I, I got this little line, it's a little different, but the movie 300, I love that. And he says, today no Spartan dies. We will take from, uh, give them nothing, but take from them everything. And I love that. But you know what? You can say, give the devil nothing, but take from him everything. And you know how you get rid of somebody that you want to take from him everything? You cut their head off. <laughs> and David just did that. When he ran up and you think about it. This little kid, he throws a rock. He hits him right between the eyes. Goliath tumbles and falls to the ground. Now, he doesn't know if he's dead. He did not know if he's knocked out. If he goes over there, he's going to rise above. But still, he charges towards this, uh, this giant. He reaches down, he grabs his sword, and he hacks his head up and holds it up. Then, of course, the deal was that if Goliath fell, they would be the servants of Israel. But they chickened out. <laughs> they turned around and took off running, you know, because they weren't going to be men of the word. But, uh, but the point is, you, you have to understand that God is your partner. In the difficult times of your life, God, is, you need to be, have faith that he's going to be there. And it's like, like I like to move your Rockies. If you ever go into the corner, you know, you got a cut man, you're going to get punched up. You're going to get, you're going to bleed a little bit in this world. And God didn't promise us a perfect, easy way, you know, and uh, you're just going to have to deal with that and understand you got a cut man in the corner. He's going to take care of it. And then you got that, the manager, he's constantly saying, come on, man, you got it, and, and you can do this, you can get it. You have to look at from your experience with God and have him encourage you that you can even accomplish it. So what I'd like to share with you uh, this morning is if I had to ask you what is the takeaway from this short talk this morning. I'm going to let you have a word. Yeah. I wish Roger was here. He's so proud of me. Uh, so, so basically, what we need to do, we need to trust in God in all things. And how do we do that? Number one, we make him the center of our lives. It's got to be the most important thing, you know. And I talk about sometimes, because we live in a negative world, we live in a place where we get up in the morning, Monday morning, boy, it just, it just comes in quivers of arrows are just flying at you. You're going to have to deal with so many things. I try to start my day out by listening to, uh, like I listen to Joyce Myers. If I, if I need healing, I'm going to go on YouTube and type in healing. Message of healing. And I'm going to immerse my mind in that message of healing. It's almost like an affirmation. You know, if you need to lose weight, you do the same thing. I don't look at you for any particular reason. That. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, so you do that. So, um, and then we must build faith. And the way you build faith, you basically immerse yourself in the scriptures. And I have listed, and I pulled these up on Google. I wanted to know what are the 10 most important things that we can do to build our faith. And if you'll go on there, and then, well, I'll leave these with you to copy, if anybody wants a copy of them. Um, says, well, Hebrew uh, in 11.16 explains the significance of faith. It reads, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who approaches him must believe that he exists. The next one here is Psalm 9.10. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Psalms 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among all nations. I'll be exalted on earth. Psalm 56, 3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. That's a great one. Short, easy to remember. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Then Luke 1, 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. 2 Chronicles 20, 20. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. With faith in his promise, and you will be successful. <clears throat> Romans 1, 17. For the gospel, the righteousness of God revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from fast to last just as it is written the righteous will have faith and then uh, Matthew 21 21 22 Jesus answered them truly I say to you 
Right. If you have faith and you do not doubt, he will not only do what you have done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and down into the sea, it, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive it in faith. That's pretty powerful. You know, and I often think about that verse, I think, well, you know, if you really think about it, you know, they, some people think that the verse of the Bible says that God helps them and help themselves. It's not in there. But it goes to reason that sometimes we have faith, we have to put with these say, legs on our prayers. You know, I've seen a lot of mountains being moved with bulldozers. You know, look for the tools, look for the ways to do it. Have faith that it can be happening. It can happen. Ephesians 3.12, in Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Last one. I can do all things through whom? Who strengthens me. And uh, so really when you think about it, we have some great examples in our scriptures. And I would encourage you to delve into the Old, Old Testament and look at some of those things, the battles and stuff that took place. You'll get a lot of encouragement from it. So I know that many of us are faced with challenges. We're faced with those things that I mentioned earlier all the battles that we face every day. But when there is one in whom we serve that can change the circumstances for every one of us. You know? So what I'd like to do now, how about let's all just come up and make a circle. We're going to join hands and we're just going to say a prayer and we're going to go ahead and dismiss. And we invite the Lord in this house this morning. I'm going to make a circle. I'm going to make a circle. So whether it's two or three gathered together, it's in our midst.